Uh, the tomb of Ipu uh, is one of the more intriguing Ramesside tombs at Dero Medina. The program of scenes in its chapel, and their diagram there over on the left from Porter Moss's map, um, are in some respects quite unusual, though not as unique as some uh, imply. And indeed, this program raises uh, important issues about Egyptian mortuary art in general. Can we explain the specific arrangements or composition of the scenes as a whole? How do they interact with each other? What kind of meaning do they have about being placed with each other or confronting each other or what it may be? Um, how do they relate to the specifics of Ipu's life? And unusually, in the case of Ipu, we have the archaeology of his living area because he's an inhabitant of the village of Dera Medina, which has already been, which is fully excavated. And we also know something about his workplaces as well. And both that, that kind of information is very unusual uh, uh, as regards tomb owners in Egypt. And then, to what degree are the topic topographical realities of Ipu's local and more broader Theban context incorporated, if they are incorporated at all, in the program. Ipu's tomb, and you see its exterior over on the right, um, is typical of Dero Medina and indeed Theban Rabbisite tombs in general, a courtyard, a chapel, probably once with a pyramid above it, uh, other rooms at surface level, and then a subterranean or lower level tomb chamber. The walls and the roof that you see over the chapel here are actually uh, relatively protective modern ones. Uh, the chapel, okay, oh that was cool, all right, oh JJ, oh no, but, okay, no, I don't need any help. Oh, perhaps this is the one, right? Yes, okay, all right. So I didn't know which goddamn little arrow to push. The chapel, or the, uh, the outermost room, uh, was cut into very poor rock, as is typical at Dero Medina. A brick-walled and vaulted chamber was built within it, upon which the painted decoration could be displayed. And here we are looking, in fact, at the southern part of the chapel. Um, uh, it was originally visited and sketchily drawn and described by a group of French scholars. And then the tomb was copied in detail by Norman de Garris Davis and published around about 1920, maybe 1924. Unfortunately, by Davis's time, much of the program had been lost, and so he had to restore uh, graphically uh, a lot of what was no longer visible. Now, Ipu. Uh, was a sculptor, a Chai Mejat of Dero Medina. Uh, he eventually became an overseer of sculptors, and as such, he would have carved reliefs in the royal tomb. He was a contemporary of Ramses II. Um, and of course, he could also have worked on the uh, depictions on pieces of uh, cultic furniture and other items of that kind. And he could also have produced three-dimensional three rendering, statuary. His tomb chapel, and uh, I've diagrammed it here, um, is relatively large for Dero Medina, where some chapels, such as Theban Tomb 340, which John Baines talked about today and which you see represented there, and as you can see from the figure of a typical little Egyptian, um, was quite tiny. But Ipu's chapel, if compared to even middling status, uh, elite chapels at Thebes is still actually relatively small. Over there on the left you have just one chamber from the tomb of Usahat of uh, Dynasty 18, which is by no means one of the largest uh, 18th Dynasty tombs. Now one scene from Ipu's uh, tomb chapel has received particular attention, that showing Ipu and his colleagues, and we don't know, uh, well no, let's amend that, I don't know, uh, who these colleagues are. Are they other craftsmen from Dero Medina? Are they Theban bureaucrats in general? Um, it, doesn't, it isn't indicated by the surviving material. But in any case, Ipu and all of them are being rewarded by Ramses II, who was displayed in a window of royal appearance, which would normally be a feature of a palace setting, but could also be located in uh, one of the West Bank uh, royal mortuary temples. Uh, this uh, scene inspired Nadine Sherpian, and others have commented on uh, this aspect of, um, of Ifu's program, including um, 
someone whose name, no, Nigel Strudwick, sorry about that, uh, to suggest that Ipu's iconography was influenced by Amana models, and indeed, reward or appointment scenes were relatively common in Amana period tombs. However, such scenes also occur elsewhere in Ramesside art. <clears throat> and although there may be an origin far back in the Amana period, uh, Ipu's um, influences may actually have been from already existing contemporary representations in a Ramesside uh, context of these windows of royal appearance. Petra Vomberg, in her book on the uh, window of appearances, uh, cites uh, no less than 10 examples of the window represented in tombs of the late post amana 18th dynasty and in the reigns of Seti I and Ramses II. Um, here, for example, is Nebwenenef, a priest of Thinus or Abydos, being advised by Ramses II that he has been promoted to the position of high priest of Amun and Thebes. And here, on a steamer from Horbeit, in the upper vignette, the office of Moses is being shown rewarded by Ramses II, while below, and you have to squint a little bit, but if you look, you will see the king is apparently standing on the lap of a colossal statue, which would have stood out in the open in front of a temple or royal palace, and he is distributing rewards in a particularly theatrical way. And this is certainly, I think, a novel innovation not known in Amana period examples. Nadine Sherpian also suggests that the high degree of naturalistically flavored observation which is seen in Ipu's chapel also reflects the influence of Amana art, as in this lively representation of goats in varied poses, grazing on stubble and attra attacking trees. But here too, I think, Ramesside artists should be allowed a degree of independent innovation. Throughout the Ramesside period, many figured ostriga from Daryl Medina display first-hand, lively observation by Daryl Medina artists of the world of nature and of the poses and actions of humans, and sometimes in poses um, uh, and in situations which are not normally reflected in mortuary art in general. Um, Ipu's chapel is also described as being unusual in not following what we might call the Ramesside template for mortuary art. In the Ramesside template, and you see it demonstrated very well here in the burial chamber of the tomb of Senechem, who was a contemporary of Seti I, the Ramesside template for mortuary art, um, in that template, the uh, so-called daily life scenes, which are prominent in 18th dynasty tomb chapels, and are conspicuous in Ipu's chapel as well, in the normal Ramesside practices to replace them by others depicting cult dedicated to deities or the dead and to imagined incidents in the netherworld. And this tomb chamber is typical of it. Nevertheless, scenes set in what we could call this world rather than the next world were not that uncommon in Dera Medina tomb chapels. If you look at the chapel programs and not the burial chamber uh, um, uh, uh, programs, uh, the presence of what we would somehow visualize as daily life or daily this world scenes um, is not that in, in common. In chapels, topics relatively common and rarer or absent in, in burial chambers, uh, where a more purely netherworld dimension is appropriate, in chapels the subject matter includes funeral processions, pilgrimage to abide us, both quite well represented, and even representations of agricultural activity and boat, boat building. So let's turn now to the specifics of the representations in uh, Ipu's chapel. Here, the north, east, and perhaps the south walls are significant, and I should drop everything. Uh, this is the north wall, this is the east wall, which is divided into two halves programmatically, and this is the south wall, and we're interested only in the lunette above the scene that shows uh, Ipu and his family receiving mortuary offerings. Uh, on the east, or entrance wall, the north half is dedicated to representing the production of food and drink involving scenes of agriculture, wine making, and fishing, and that has to do with this area here. On the south half of the east wall, the themes of the registers are less closely related to each other. You have the reward scene above, given greater uh, space than any other register, presumably because it was such a significant uh, incident in Ipu's life. Below this was the funerary procession, uh, culminating in his tomb, 
this little peaked uh, structure here, uh, and above it, though I didn't indicate in the diagram, the hills of Western Thebes are indicated. The next scene down is more enigmatic, and I'll come back to it later. Uh, and then the bottom scene shows a series of sacred boats arriving at some waterside location and Ipu venerating them uh, as they reach the shore. Um, it's been suggested that the sacred boats may have included that of Amun-Ra, who regularly visited the West Bank on festival occasions. But uh, we have to remember that like other Dero Medina villages, Ipu also served in the priest of a local cult. He was a servitor of the deified King Amenhotep I, the patron saint of Dero Medina, so we have to take into account the possibility that uh, there are references to Amenhotep I, even if they're not explicit, uh, in some of the scenes in Ipu's chapel. And Davies even suggested that up here, adjacent to the south half of the east wall, on the south wall itself, that perhaps the lunette had had a vignette uh, depicting uh, a ritual procession of Amenhotep I, although he found the fragments on the floor, so that's only um, a supposition. Finally, on the north wall, up here, the, there are also this world scenes, which are prominent. Carpenters and sculptors work on two large, maybe three large examples of wooden temple furniture intended for a chapel or temple of the deified Amenhotep I, that's plainly indicated by the inscriptions, while above that, up here towards the upper part, uh, Daryl Medina craftsman, presumably Daryl Medina craftsman, uh, produced the many items needed for Ipu's funeral and burial. So that's the, the basic structure of these two walls, which I think are particularly important, and also the ones in which these daily life scenes, which are unusual in the Ramesside context, are so uh, prominent. Uh, finally, um, on the west wall, the wall closest to the burial chamber, the scenes depict Ipu and others venerating deities who controlled their destiny <coughs> in the afterlife. So on the west wall, there's a kind of retreat away from an emphasis on daily life or this world scenes. So here you have the veneration of uh, Osiris and Hathor, south of the, uh, of the, uh, on, the south, on the south part of the west wall, and on the east part, you have the veneration of um, Anubis and Ptah Soka Osiris. Incidentally, the work, and I think you can perhaps pick it up from David's graphic work, the work on the west wall is exceptionally fine. It was seemingly done by a specially skillful artist, while the other artists, while they were very talented working, the, working in the other parts of the tomb, were not so skilled as those active here. And this would correspond to the special importance of these particular scenes on the West Wall, the only ones in which the great deities of the netherworld are manifest. Um, as to the specifics, uh, and I hope you can make it out, I know it's rather detailed, this is the south half of the East Wall without the reward scene, which was set above the ones you see here. Due to subsequent damage, much of the representations had dis disappeared by Davis's day, and he had to re reconstruct these registers as best he could. Above, then, you have the funeral rites, uh, starting here and ending up with the tomb over here, um, culminating at the tomb. Below is one of the more unusual scenes in Ipu's program, a very famous one, often reproduced. Um, a structure set in a plantation of trees and flowers, all arranged around the body uh, of an artificial pool. An artificial pool. Uh, the naturali naturalistically rendered trees have attracted much favorable comment from art historians, and the stocky physiques of the laborers, which are very different from the more slender and elegant forms of many of the other representations of people in Ipu's program, the stocky figures of the laborers have also been noted. The use of the uh, water lifting shaduf device is unusual, but not unique to Ipu's tomb chapel. And then finally below, you have what is left of the procession of sacred boats and their reception by Ipu and others. On the east wall, the north half, the other half of the wall we were just looking at, uh, which is separated from the south half by the entrance doorway, is a representation which is, or our representations, which are very different in topic 
from those on the south half of the east wall and also very different in the overall scheme of composition. They form a highly unified composition throughout and they are all focused on depicting uh, the provisioning of abund abundant food and drink to the deceased on an eternal basis. In fact, at one level, despite the representations incorporating much lively uh, observation that seems to be this world in nature, overall, uh, the uh, east wall, the north half of the east wall, is set in the netherworld and represents, in the mode of this world imagery, the fields of Ayaru, where the deceased themselves effortlessly, effortlessly produce their own uh, necessities. This netherworld ambience is provided by bracketing scenes. In the upper left, sorry, you're going to have to squint very hard, but in the upper left, Ipu and his wife personally are shown plucking flax for linen and plowing the fields, typical activities of deceased individuals in uh, the fields of Yaru in the netherworld. In the lower right, down here, um, Ipu is uh, shown fowling uh, in the marshes, accompanied by his family. Scenes of fouling in tomb chapels may reflect elite actuality, but they also have meanings relevant to the netherworld. Amongst others, such scenes refer to the repelling of dangerous and chaotic negative forces symbolized by birds, and in Ipu's uh, case, in fact, uh, his image is placed right next to the entrance doorway, and he himself is oriented to be able to attack any dangerous element that tries to enter into the chapel through the entrance way. So the scene signifies the apotropaic protection that has been ritually imparted to his tomb as it is to other tombs and other sacred sculptures. Nevertheless, as you can see, uh, other scenes in this composition uh, also draw heavily on this world imagery, uh, even if they're referring uh, to the netherworld, basically. Um, it's as if these scenes are referring to the actual provision of the foodstuffs on actual estates endowed for the mortuary cult. But like did, did Dero Medina villages, who was salaried by the government, did they have the resources to set up funerary estates? And someone may be able to tell me that. Grain production, the securing of meats, fowls, and fish, and the production of wine are all featured in vignettes which are full of closely observed details. One register in particular, squint again, right here. Um, uh, one register in particular is notable for the local market which is shown surrounding the two ships. They're moored here and the market occupies this area and this area over here. Uh, men barter grain for food and drink proffered to them by women traders and market scenes of this occur elsewhere in the 18th and Ramesside, 18th dynasty and Ramesside period. And they've been studied by Christiana Pino. Um, one wonders if this episode, however, might have specific local reference. Documents from Daryl Medina do refer to a nearby marketplace, and that marketplace is at the edge of a waterway of some kind. So this may be a reference to local, local topography. Um, on the north wall, adjacent to the north half of the east wall, are scenes of production. Craftsmen produce two, maybe originally three, part of the program is gone, uh, elaborately decorated pieces of cultic furniture which are intended to go to a chapel dedicated to the deified Amenhotep I. And remember, Ipu was a priest of that particular cult, as well as an overseer of the sculptors and carpenters who are producing uh, these uh, objects of temple use, uh, and this is an act presumably enhancing his prestige. Above this, other craftsmen, presumably overseen by Ipu himself, prepare the uh, funeral beer, the coffins, and the furniture needed for his tomb. Produced for his own self-interest, the lavish productions attest to Ipu's high, if localized, prestige and status, and mark the success of an orderly and loyal life that will merit his eternal reward in the afterlife. So to summarize the preceding overview, the program in Ipu's chapel seems to be carefully differentiated between interrelated events significant to the, to the merit his life provides him and the eternal reward and renewal he will receive in the afterlife. Thus on the north, 
up here. Uh, there are meritorious uh, uh, acts of, of a special character uh, that Ipu is involved in, making the temple furniture, making his own uh, burial furniture. Uh, and on the east wall, on the south half, there are propitious encounters of, with power, as I call them, further reflective of Ipu's prestige and his effective service. The encounter with Ramses II in the reward scene, and possibly an encounter with the great god Amun-Ra, or at least some other significant divine figure in the scene with sacred barks. Uh, the east wall, um, the north half of the east wall, um, Ren oh, no it doesn't. Where am I here? Um, Oh yes, it does. Okay, so this this section of the uh, of the of the east wall uh, re renders the reward that Ipu has received, not the reward from Ramses II, namely the beneficent and and protected existence that he anticipates in the afterlife. Although the image of the afterlife is conveyed by imagery derived from sharp observation of this world events or features, on the south wall. Uh, down here, the dominant scene is that of the offering cult being made to Ipu and his family, which ensures that they are of their afterlife existence. Uh, and this, of course, actually references the chapel itself. The activity shown on the south wall reflects the activity that actually took place in this particular uh, structure. And then the west wall scenes um, involving the lords and ladies of the netherworld itself point towards the burial chamber within and the netherworld or the afterlife that enfolds it. Now, a few words about compositional structure. Uh, I've noted interconnections in terms of content as regards the north and the east walls, and now I'd like to suggest that overall, there is a broader compositional structure in which two units, which emphasize references to this world activities and features, and that would be the north wall and the south half of the east wall, these two units flank a central unit, the north part of the east wall, um, uh, which is different from the other two in compositional structure in its visual effect and which represents the netherworld, albeit highly tinged strongly with this world details. Uh, and it is, on, it is in this nether world that Ipu will enjoy eternal sustenance as well as repeated rebirths via association with the solar cycle. In this connection, some horizontally oriented uh, connections, possible connections, form compositional links between these three units. This is most obvious in the lower register, which in every case uh, links up with uh, a riverine or waterway environments even though they're somewhat different in emphasis. Above this, the, the making of temple furniture here approximately lines up with this representation of a structure that may be a shrine, may be a shrine for which the temple furniture was intended. Above that, um, above that, producing the funerary items, which you see on the north wall, um, uh, doesn't exactly line up, but references the actual funeral in which all of these fu funeral items are actually shown, depicted again, the actual funeral here, though this has been pushed down in position by the need to have a larger than usual register for the reward ceremony. So these uh, direct, if approximate, interconnections uh, along the horizontal line are not echoed in the central one. This is quite a different a kind of um, representational mode. Uh, and this may be, again, to emphasize the special importance and other world character of that central component. Um, central vertical axes are also often used for com compositional uh, or as compositional devices in Egyptian art. Here, contrasting simply the, uh, the two halves of the east wall, the southern half and the north half, and, and indicating the central vertical axis of each of these halves. Um, you should note that in the north, south half of the east wall, if Davis's restorations are correct, the key, key features in the composition tend to cluster on or overlap or be very near the vertical axis. The chief sacred boat, 
the shrine or whatever it is, and the uh, the, the beer, the coffin, ca carrying uh, Ipu's coffin, are all related to that central vertical axis. The north half of the east wall has a very different relationship compositionally with its central vertical axis. Uh, here, the different components are arranged in such a way as to create a, a much more balanced or symmetrical composition. In three of the registers, separate scenes are allocated space that's roughly similar on either side of the vertical axis. Not with precise uh, exactitude, but it's a very strong tendency. In the fourth register, the second one from the bottom, this one down here, um, this is uh, structured somewhat differently with regard to the central vertical axis. We have symmetrically sized components on either side of a representation which is squarely centered on the axis. This, in fact, is an elaborate representation of winemaking, and perhaps it's being given um, increased emphasis by its central position and the symmetrical arrangements on either side of it. Wine was of great significance to deceased individuals, as you heard from John Baines earlier today. Deceased individuals sought transcendental or exalted states, which assisted in their desired transformations via alcohol-based intoxication. It wasn't just to make you feel really good, it was really to do something very good for you. Note also how, note also how um, an entire prototypical Nile Valley landscape is being generated by the East Wall river or other kinds of waterways down here, the alluvial plain represented here, and the, uh, uh, the desert and the foothills represented over there in the scene of the tomb. There is also a certain narrative or uh, sequence here in that uh, elements which of activities which are depicted on the north wall necessarily precede uh, activities depicted on the, on the east wall, uh, where here you have the funerary items being made, and then on the south half of the east wall you see them actually being carried to the tomb. Um, I don't want to talk about that, so that was good. And then finally the composition of the north half of the east wall, uh, the, this particular one here, is the latest in the narrative because it represents uh, Ipu's final stage of existence transferred successfully into the um, netherworld bliss that he will hopefully continue in, continue in forever. So finally, what relationship might the scenes in Ipu's chapel have to the local or, or the Theban social and topographical environment? Uh, to what extent are accurate and significant aspects of those environments present in his program? The local situation we know well. The, li the living um, uh, inhabited a village crammed with small houses, the actual village of Daryl Medina, the craftsman and the artist who worked in the royal tomb lived here. Uh, and these small houses are indi indicative of a relatively low elite status for the inhabitants of the village. The living uh, members of the village also tended the numerous chapels of local deities which fill the area to the north and the northwest. And finally, the dead occupied uh, the cemetery on the western hill face, uh, but one that is uh, overshadowed in this particular um, aerial view. Uh, here is the village and its environs in a little bit more detail. Uh, over here is Ipu's relatively large tomb. I think that's it right there. This is the cemetery field in general. These are the chapels here. And this is the village itself. And on this particular plan, um, optimistically, it's got a house marked as an, a house of Ipu. I don't know whether that's accurate, and I don't know if it's the right Ipu, um, but um, it's interesting that someone felt they could say that. Um, and then here is the larger Theban environment uh, that would be also be part of Ipo's world. The Daryl Medina people were not restricted to their village. Uh, they went to work in the Valley of the Kings. They probably could visit uh, the cemeteries of the West Bank. And we know for sure that some of them were active over in the great city on the East Bank as well. 
Um, so, given that range of contact was the window of appearance in the reward scene of Ipu in an East Bank palace, uh, was it in the mortuary temple of Ramses II, which included a, t a palace structure? Or could the structure, the window of appearance, uh, actually be somewhere in Dero Medina itself and be only a symbolic, non-actual presence of the king represented perhaps by a statue? Not every reward scene needs to actually involve the king. It involves only some kind of representation of the king. In this regard, identification of the enigmatic structure that is seen on the south half of the east wall with its associated plantation of trees, garden, and pool has been a matter of debate. Davis thought it was Ipu's house, but that is not usually accepted now, and indeed, the plantation would be something that could hardly be fitted into the crowded little village. Stevens and Smith thought it might be a small temple. If so, could it be a local shrine for the deified Amenhotep I, of whom Ipu was a priest? And we'll skip that. Um, an actual chapel of Amenhotep I has been tentatively identified at Terra Medina. It is a together in uh, Daryl Medina. Uh, this is supposedly a chapel of Amenhotep the I. Could this be the structure shown in Ipu's tomb? But if so, how could it accommodate a plantation and pool? The chapel in question does have an unusually large court, uh, but it's still a relatively small space. And it's possible there might have been a miniature version of um, Ipu's uh, um, portico and, and garden um, in this case. And this was going to be interesting, but I've talked about that enough. What are the topographical aspects of Ipu's program? Does it try to present aspects of the local village or of the larger Theban environment with some degree of accuracy at regard top of the topographical components of one, the local, uh, environment or both, including the Theban environment as well. Now occasionally it seems to me that one can argue for some Theban tomb chapels, but not for all of them, um, that there is a reflection of the, lo the local or the regional topography. For example, in the tomb chapel of Usahat, under the reign of Amenhotep II, Usahat makes offerings to Amun-Ra of Karnak on either sides of an open, empty doorway. Um, but perhaps, conceptually, the doorway frames the target of Usahat's piety, the actual temple of Karnak, far away on the east bank. To the northwest in Usahat's chapel, there is a representation of the enthroned king, which would implicitly be in a palace. And as regards positioning of that scene vis-a-vis -vis the offering to Amun episodes, this royal image could evoke the royal palace that may have actually lain also northwest of the Amun temple in actuality. And then finally, in the inner chapel, on one wall face, the funerary procession of Usahat leads us appropriately towards the actual tomb, which of course is the area to the west of Karnak and its palace, perhaps displayed in the frontal chamber, and the netherworld uh, it, it gives access to. Uh, on the facing walls, images of Usahat hunting and fowling uh, might indicate or reflect uh, elite uh, leisurely activities, but they are also symbolically charged actions in the netherworld itself. Um, and I don't want to talk about that. As regards these uh, issues in Ipu's tomb, um, I present this, no, I'm finishing. I present this uh, diagram here, uh, which is not in the final form I would like, but will do for now. And I want to talk about the top one up here. Along the notional east-west axis of the chapel, the program presents a prototypical Nile landscape with river, floodplain, and desert flank. And that is appropriate to the east, since the west world equally appropriately represents the mortuary deities in the netherworld. 
along the north-south axis of the chapel, there's a tendency to present scenes of the living uh, in the scenes up in the northern area up here, and uh, 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 scenes associated with the dead down here. So up here you have workmen who would be presumably working in the village itself, the world of the living. Down here uh, you have a representation of the cemetery and you also have a representation of the funerary offerings. And so what I would suggest here is the positioning of north to south here reflects the Egyptian concept that south is associated with Osiris, Lord of the Dead, and north is associated with uh, the sun god and the world of the living. So it's a rather complicated idea of what kind of topography uh, might be represented. So these are some of my thoughts about this fascinating chapel. Um, and I think that I should close by a representation of Ipu and his family themselves on the west wall. Uh, as so often in Ipu's program, this is enlivened by some lively details. Uh, in this case, the family cat sitting under the wife's chair and the family cat's kitten playing with Ipu on his lap. Thank you.